remain standing for prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your glory. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your grace. And open our lips to sing your praise. Amen. You may like to have your service book or booklet open at the Gospel reading, because this is the actual reading uh, we've come to this morning. Over the past three Sundays, we've been going through chapter 6 of John's Gospel in stages, starting with the feeding of the 5,000 in verses 1 to 21, and then going on as Jesus and the Jewish leaders discuss the meaning of that sign. Today we're looking at verses 51 to 58, which you'll find on page 8 of your service booklet. The last reading will be next week. The theme is the same. Jesus as the bread of life, although there is also a secondary but related theme in today's readings, that of wisdom. And picking up from last week, Jesus says that whoever takes the food he has to offer will live forever. A quality of life, we might emphasize, which begins here and now as soon as we start to partake of this special food. But today, Jesus also says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Um, surprisingly, uh, the Jews... Uh, are deeply shocked at this statement and dispute among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? There's a certain contempt coupled with an ignorance of Jesus' true identity contained in the words, this man. Of course, the Jews were a highly cultured people with a long and distinguished history. Cannibalism was not one of their customs. And they abhorred the practices of some of their neighbors who were not above human sacrifice. But Jesus, who who must have been aware of their reactions, only gives greater emphasis to his words. Verse 53. Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And to the eating of his flesh is now added the drinking of his blood. We've been going to the Eucharist or Holy Communion for many years now. We've become completely used to many of the things we hear. Again and again we hear with complete equanimity, take this, all of you, and eat, this is my body. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood. Imagine a complete stranger to our liturgy coming in and hearing these words. What are they to make of them? So let us now hear them for, perhaps for the very first time, from the lips of Jesus as he spoke them on that day. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood... Very strange words, not only strange, but repulsive and even offensive. You see, the drinking of blood must have seemed particularly disconcerting to a Jewish audience. They had both a reverence and a horror of blood. They saw it as the source of life. How often they saw their young men in battle lose all their blood and die. At the same time, to come in contact with blood was to become ritually unclean. When a woman gave birth and blood was lost, she could not approach the temple for several weeks, longer still if the child was a girl. We remember the gospel story of the woman who was suffering from a bleeding problem for 12 years. She desperately wanted Jesus to heal her. But, because of the large crowd around, she did not dare to reveal herself and her condition. In her faith, she just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and she was healed. 
And almost certainly too, this was the reason the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side when they saw the man lying on the road and undoubtedly bleeding in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. They were on their way to the temple in Jerusalem and could not afford to become contaminated. And that was the lesson. They put ritual purity above love of neighbor. And as we know, observant Jews today will only eat meat from which the blood has been drained. And now here is Jesus asking these same people to drink his blood. You do not have to be a Jew to find the idea abhorrent. No wonder there were people who thought he was out of his mind, apart from the scandal his words gave. It's not surprising that a few verses later on, we read that when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? And as we shall hear next week, some of them left Jesus altogether. And yet Jesus makes no apologies for what he has said. On the contrary, he tells his hearers that if they do not eat his flesh and drink his blood, they will not have life. Those who do eat and drink are guaranteed life, eternal life. Because Jesus' flesh is true food, And his blood is true drink. Whoever eats me will live because of me, he says. What on earth could he mean? Well, plainly his words are not to be taken literally. He was not advocating cannibalism. Jesus answered his critics by pointing out that his words were to be understood spiritually. The physical or literal meaning of the words was plainly ruled out. But what was the spiritual meaning? What we have in Jesus' strange language is a powerful metaphor stating that a share in the life of God, eternal life, is granted to those who in faith come to Jesus. Was Jesus just talking about the Eucharist with which his words have an obvious affinity? It was much more than that. To eat the flesh of Jesus and to drink his blood is to be totally united with him. To be filled with his spirit and vision. It is to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as we take food and drink into our bodies, so by faith we take Jesus into our hearts and we go forward in his strength, not our own. It means totally sharing Jesus' vision, his ideas, his values. It is to be totally identified with his mission to establish the kingdom of God in this world. It is to be nourished by his word as it comes to us through the Holy Scriptures and have our lives directed by it. And because his flesh and blood are so closely related with his suffering and death, we are to identify ourselves too with that total self-giving, to carry our own cross after him and to accept the sufferings which come into our lives. So today Jesus is inviting us to follow him, to be with him, to share totally and unconditionally in his mission. And that brings us to the secondary theme of today's readings. Turn back to page six, the reading from Proverbs. To live like this is true wisdom, as we see in this first reading. And you see here, wisdom is personified as having built a house with seven pillars. She has prepared a magnificent banquet and then sent out her servants to call on those who are ignorant, who lack wisdom, saying, come and eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of wisdom and insight. 
And Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, our second reading, also tells us, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. The food that Jesus offers, the bread and wine that are his own flesh and blood, are the sources of wisdom, giving, as they do, a true understanding of the meaning and purpose of life. To eat that food is to be close to him, not just physically, but in mind and heart. <clears throat> and that would be the link between Jesus as the bread of life and the source of wisdom. The source of wisdom in our lives is the total acceptance of the vision of life which Jesus gives. He is the source, the bread that provides that vision. And the special way in which we express that and by which we remind ourselves of this call is through our celebration of the Eucharist. Where we eat the bread and drink the wine. Powerful symbols of the body and blood of Christ. But we need to remember that this is a sacrament. It is the outward sign that points to the inner, deeper reality. Our ongoing relationship with Jesus. In celebrating the Holy Eucharist, we are saying that we want to deepen that relationship with Jesus Christ, with his gospel, and with the community which is his visible presence among us. And so we receive the bread and wine in faith. And as the Book of Common Prayer says, we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. This life in Christ is the nourishment in the most real sense of our life. Without this food and drink, we will die of starvation. Our bodies, of course, will keep going, but in a very real sense, we will have died spiritually. So when we do participate in the Eucharist in a few moments and receive communion, let us not do so passively, as if Jesus was just coming to us. It's not just a pious, thank you, Jesus, we need to receive actively. When we receive the bread and wine, the minister says, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, keep you in eternal life. And we respond by saying, Amen, which means yes, spot on, so be it. But that yes is not just an act of faith in the presence of Christ, but a total commitment of myself to Christ in the community of which I am a member. <clears throat> in saying Amen, we are accepting Christ and his whole gospel. We, accept, we are accepting his victories and his sufferings. We are saying we want to be with him all the way. To serve him with all our heart and mind and soul. And to work with him for the making of a better world. A world of truth and love. A world of justice and peace. A world of freedom and happiness. A world where none go hungry or are malnourished. When we see ourselves as part of that great endeavour, then we know that in a very real sense we have been fed and nourished by the body and blood of Christ and we are drawn into deeper fellowship with him and with one another. Let's pause for prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, in your love, you enable us to share in your life. So fill your church with this vitality that it may proclaim your glory to all the world. And as we share in the sacrament of your body and blood, may we abide in you as you abide in us. Amen. <clears throat>